Okay.
Good afternoon, everyone. Testing. Testing one, two. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think this is for the radio. This is for you, right, boss? Volume up. Testing. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Can you pick up if I just use this? Very good. Once again, uh, good evening, good afternoon. How's everybody? Welcome to the Thurgood Marshall Center. The Thurgood Marshall Center is here to serve the community, the greater community in the Washington, Baltimore, Northern Virginia area. And we're very thankful that the Thurgood Marshall Center for Social Justice has decided to have a lecture series. Uh, this is the second one. Uh, the first one was on Black Lives Matter back in November. And as we approach the 87th birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we thought we would dedicate tonight's lecture uh, to Dr. King's legacy, but more importantly, to what does Dr. King's legacy mean for us today as we begin 2016? And in particular, we've invited our young brothers and sisters tonight because in truth, the legacy of what we do for freedom, justice, and equality not will be is already in our young people's hands. So let's give everybody a hand for coming out tonight, but particularly our young people who are here. And I want to especially thank Sam Collins, who is a young activist, a writer, entrepreneur, with a global perspective, not only here in America, but all around the world where our people are, for helping to organize the respondents who will come uh, after I uh, give my brief remarks about Dr. King. Sam, Sam Collins, stand up. Sam, I want everybody to see you. This is Sam Collins. <clears throat> Those of you who were here in November when we had the first lecture, Sam also responded, and he did such a great job. I actually thought I should be responding to his remarks, and that's good. Uh, a teacher and a mentor always desires that those they teach and those that they mentor rise above the teacher, rise above the mentor. Each generation of young people, it's just not a matter of handing you a baton. We want you to run the race. We want you to win the race. We want you to break more records than the generation before. And I believe, some of you heard me say this before, and before I get into the lecture, that our youth today is the best generation of young people we've ever been blessed to witness. They're creative, they're talented, they're gifted. But what our young people need today is our encouragement, our support, our embrace. And yes, sometimes even pushing them forward to greater heights. And that's the whole purpose of this lecture series. I want to, again, thank the Thurgood Marshall Center. I want to thank REACT Radio. This has been uh, video streamed live uh, so that millions of brothers and sisters around the world uh, can join us by internet radio, by live radio. So let's give REACT Radio a hand for live streaming tonight. Now, I've made some remarks that I'm going to try to follow my outline. Because I work with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when I was a very young person, I was a teenager. I joined the NAACP when I was 12 years old in my hometown of Oxford, North Carolina. And I was so thankful that my parents, my mother and father, who were school teachers, allowed me to be in the movement at an early age. Uh, I must be honest, I did sort of make my parents nervous because sometimes when I went out to demonstrations or protests, uh, quite frankly, they didn't know if I was coming home. But 
the fact that they were willing to take a risk to let me go, I realized that I couldn't just be undisciplined because I wanted to go back home to my parents, but I also wanted to show my parents they did the right thing by trusting me uh, to go out there and protest and join the movement at an early age. So I grew up in the civil rights movement. By the time I was 14, I was the statewide youth director for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was start, started in the mid-1950s. I was born in 1948. So by the mid-1950s, during the Montgomery bus boycott, of course, when the Thurgood Marshall Center, the famous uh, 1954 Supreme Court decision that ruled that segregated schools were unconstitutional, there was really no such thing as uh, separate and unequal schools. Well, separate and equal schools. The separate schools were unequal. That was the principle. And certainly pushing forward to demand equal justice, not just in schools, but in public accommodations and all of life. Just one other little note I want to tell you. I grew up in a all black community. I never had an opportunity to even sit beside a white person until my sophomore year in college. Now, one of the reasons why I'm because I never grew up with an inferiority complex because there was no basis of being inferior when everything around you was black. The grocery store owner was black, the barbershop owner was black, the beautician was black. Um, when they did not allow us to have our own recreation field, my parents donated land. We had something called Chavis Park. If you're out there with Black Lives Matter, uh, challenging the injustice, the police brutality, and somebody arrests you, then yes, that is a badge of honor. But if you robbing somebody in our own community, if you're selling drugs, or if you knocking one of our own brothers and sisters in the head for some reason, even if it's a reason of passion, that is not a badge of honor. I just want to clear that up, because a lot of times when I talk about you know, being arrested, and how many of you young people, and how many of y'all saw the movie Belly? It's okay, you can raise your hand. Yeah. To the slightly older people in my age in here. Belly is a hip hop movie uh, produced by Hype Williams. In fact, Hype is a videographer. He's only done one full length movie, that was Belly. And at the end of the movie, I was playing my natural role as a minister. DMX has a gun on me. I'm talking to him out of shooting me, but I'm not just talking DMX out of shooting me, I'm speaking to young brothers and sisters in that episode of the movie. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because we are impacted by culture, by music, by movies. You know, it affects our consciousness. Now, when I was growing up, I, we didn't have movies like Belly or other kinds of video. In fact, when I was growing up, there was no such thing as the internet. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have devices. All we had was one another. Even when we had to spread the word that we were going to have a mass meeting, we had to uh, handprint leaflets. Some of y'all don't know what a mimeograph machine is or carbon paper. When I was in school your age, uh, there was no word process. I couldn't hit spell check. I had to know the word. I had a big dictionary. And I had to know how to find and make sure that I got my word spell right. To do a footnote, I had to have a ruler to measure an inch from the bottom of the page to put the footnote right. And if you make a mistake using carbon paper, very often, most teachers back in those days would not accept a smudge when you try to erase something from a carbon paper. So guess what, it means what? You have to write or type the paper, that page, all over again. 
So by the time you submitted something to a teacher, you not only knew it was correct structurally, but you knew it was correct content because you had to do that paper over and over again. What I'm trying to tell, uh, say to our brothers and sisters, not tell you, relate to you, share with you, we have had hard times before. These are not the first time we've had hard times. This is not the first time we've had police brutality. If you check out the Kerner Commission report, K-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E the Kerner Commission report after a lot of the riots, including this city in the 1960s, after Dr. King's assassination, uh, the President of the United States ordered for a study on why riots happened. And that study concluded that there was two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal. But it also said that the precipitating incidents in a lot of the riots was what? Police brutality. So what happened in Ferguson? What happened in South Carolina? What happened in New York? What happened in Tamir Rice in Cleveland? Has, in fact, happened before. The question is, what do we do about it? And the thing that I'm going to share with you now for the next few minutes is how Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. assembled first a group of ministers, preachers. He was Baptist. He assembled Baptist ministers, Methodist ministers, uh, Church and God in Christ ministers, all denominations. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was called Southern, but actually, there were ministers from Los Angeles in the SCLC. There were ministers from New York. Y.T. Walker, some top minister from Harlem, but yet he was a leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Malcolm X had it right. The South, for black people, is anything south of the Canadian border. The whole country is the South. So when we talk about social transformation, we talk about Southern this and whether or not there'll be the rise of the the old South or the rise of the new South, or sometimes a lot of our brothers and sisters, if you go to Detroit today, Detroit is on a rebuild, you'll tell a lot of the families from Detroit migrated from Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Arkansas. You can trace migration patterns. Same thing in Chicago, same thing in New York, New Jersey. Even Washington has somewhat of a migration pattern uh, from the South. So in a sense, when Dr. King started the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in the mid-1950s, it wasn't just for brothers and sisters in the South. That's the point I'm trying to make. It was an assembly of trying to put the church back in the forefront of the movement. If you um, know that the first publication, Freedom's Journal, in 1827, started out of a black church in New York. Today, I stand before you as the president and CEO of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, a position I actually sought after because I realized that in 2014, 2015, and now in 2016, we still have 206 black-owned newspapers in the United States that publish every week. And if you aggregate all of the readership that we reach on a weekly basis, that is the black press, is over 20 million brothers and sisters every week. But a lot of times I think some because of technological advances and also I think there's been some shift in how we value what's black owned, how we value our own businesses. Uh, there was a time, probably because of segregation, that in every black community, you had thriving black-owned businesses. And when I mean thriving, I mean thriving, who made a difference. My hometown, Oxford, is near Durham. I'm, I was born in a country town, plantation town. So the big city for me was Durham, North Carolina. And the brothers and sisters in Durham were very, uh, they not only had major universities, colleges, but they started businesses. North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company was started in Durham and became one of the largest black businesses in the world. 
the Spalding Company and others started Mechanics and Farmers Bank. Very similar to, oh, you know about Mechanics and Farmers Bank. It's a black owned bank. Here in Washington, we have Industrial Bank. At one time, we had over 300 black owned banks in the United States. Today, in 2016, we have less than 20. Yet, in 2015, we spent $1.2 trillion as consumers. So we, we have more money than we've ever had in America. We spend more money than we ever had in America, but we own less businesses. We own less control over the education of our children. We have less prowess about what happens in the courts, in the judicial system. And so Dr. King was a very wise prophetic preacher. Someone asked me once, I, I knew both uh, Malcolm X and Dr. King, somebody asked me what was the difference between Martin and Malcolm. The truth is they had more similarities than differences. But one of the things was Malcolm, if you listen to Malcolm X, you would want to leave that room and go out and make sure that nobody does anything to you or to any other black person. When you listen to Dr. King, Dr. King inspired people to go out with the same love, self-love, but more importantly, Dr. King made you feel that the movement was so invincible that it was worth all of us being on the front line of the struggle. I don't know if you've ever been in a civil rights march, but do you know what the most important position in the march? It's not who's up front, it's who's at the end of the march. It's who's, who's the rank and files. I used to be marching SCLC and Dr. King would say, check out the back, check out the back. And I always wonder, but why you want to check out the back? He says, son, the most important when you're in leadership position, it's not who's leading, it's but who's following. You have to take responsibility. If somebody comes to your meeting, you gotta make sure that meeting is safe. If somebody, uh, I, I, some of you may not realize this, some of the brothers and sisters my age will tell you, it used to be controversial. You can buy an NAACP membership card, but you better never get caught with that card in your pocket. Because if you get stopped by one of these state troopers, a police officer, and they see you fumbling for your license and see the NAACP card, you won't get harsher treatment. So when I was growing up, my parents were NAACP members, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of my relatives kept their NAACP cards in a desk drawer, didn't keep it in their pocket. When I was 12 years old, I got my NAACP card, I would pull that card out before I pulled my report card out. Not that I was looking for controversy, but when I'm trying to tell the young people, each generation is supposed to be more militant than the prior generation. So don't think that the fact that you are restless, to think the fact that you are uncomfortable with injustice, don't think there's something wrong with you. No, there's something right with you. Because no generation should be more tolerant of injustice than the former generation. Dr. King said it like this. We should be impatient with injustice, but we have to be patient with the victims of injustice. In other words, we can't lose patience with one another. And a lot of times, because of what we go through in life, rather than take our anxieties or even our angers out on the perpetrators of the real violence in our community, we take it out on one another. And, and what Dr. King taught us in SCLC was not only how to be good community organizers, but how to challenge authority, and make your point, but not necessarily let those in power, those in authority, take advantage of our anger. It's okay to be angry, but it's what you do with your anger. You know, 
And that is why when the young people in Ferguson, you know, expressed their anger with hands up, don't shoot, it was interesting. All of a sudden, the established media uh, tried to make it look like that they were being provocative or provoking violence when they were actually anti against the violence that had been perpetrated on the community. And when the U.S. Justice Department did a study, it showed that in that part of Missouri, outside of St. Louis, there had been a pattern, a systematic pattern of law enforcement stopping, writing tickets, basically extracting money for no reason, using law enforcement as the disguise, and a whole pattern. So a lot of the young people that you saw protesting in Ferguson, their parents had already known and experienced what they had experienced. And it comes a certain time in everybody's life, as the scripture would say, that your cup runs over. And Dr. King sensed that the cup in black America was running over. This is in the 1950s. How many of you remember the Emmett Till case? I was about nine, 10 years old when that happened. Young brother from Chicago goes down to Money, Mississippi. He's beaten to death, you know, for allegedly either smiling or whistling or saying something out of the way of a white woman who owned a grocery store. But actually, what happened was there was so much hatred in that part of Mississippi. When they beat Emmett Till to death, they just weren't beating Emmett Till. It was about beating blacks in Mississippi back to submission. And they had always used violence to beat us into submission. Lynchings. If it hadn't been for the NAACP, a lot of people tell me, well, is the NAACP still relevant? I think it is. I think all of our organizations. I told you I joined the NAACP when I was 12. What I didn't tell you, I also joined CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, to me, anything black, I'm in it. You wouldn't just join one organization. You try to join as many organizations as possible. And back in those days, it wasn't a rivalry as it is somewhat today among our organizations. You can be in more than one organization. These, these are not street gangs or turf. You know, because I'm in this organization, I'm not going to like you because you're in another organization. No. You want to be involved in all the organizations. And Dr. King, to his credit, a lot of, I'll just be honest with you, because of Dr. King's popularity, some of the other civil rights leaders really didn't like him. And I don't want to stir up nothing, but I'm going to tell you, there were a lot of cities that Dr. King would go where he could not find a church to preach because they felt he was too controversial. And then J. Edgar Hoover, when he was alive, tried to say that Dr. King was a communist. It's interesting how they put different terms to undermine you. He's a socialist. He's a communist. Of course, Donald Trump would say he's a Muslim. I'm just making my point. Be careful with the labels that those in power put on people who are trying to get power. We should never, in my view, in Dr. King's view, even though he was very articulate, Dr. King had a way with words. In fact, he would use some, sometimes the phraseology of those in power, those in power, and he would turn those phrases back on them. On April 1967, one year, before his assassination, he made a speech in Riverside Church. And Dr. King, for the first time, spoke out against the Vietnam War. And a lot of people who were sitting in the church, Riverside Church was a big sanctuary, 
got very nervous. Boy, you remember. They said, well, Dr. King's gone too far. This has nothing to do with civil rights. You know, we're going to get black people in trouble. Don't leave those Vietnamese alone. But by 1967, Dr. King's consciousness, Dr. King's awareness, his, not just his speeches, his speeches reflected how he felt. His speeches reflect his own maturity as he was maturing, not just as a, a leader from Alabama or a leader in America, but a leader on the world stage. It always happens. Because the more you see, the more you understand, the more that you connect or converge the dots in your own life and with other people's lives, you begin to see not so much of the differences, but you begin to see what it means to be a part of the human family. And Dr. King began to utter this phrase called the beloved community. In spite of all of the threats that came in him, bombed his house twice, been arrested numerous times, the FBI planting bugs in his rooms. One famous one in the Willard Hotel. You know where the Willard Hotel is here in Washington? The FBI knew that Dr. King was going to stay in the Willard Hotel, and they went in the all the room and had cameras, bugs, and everything. Then they fabricated so-called results of the bugging. And a year before Dr. King was assassinated, the FBI wrote Dr. King a letter encouraging him to commit suicide. And when you say, well, why would the federal government do that? Why would J. Edgar Hoover do that? What was the motive? Was Dr. King a bad guy? A bad leader? You know? What would make the government and all of its power um, fear the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. It was some rough times in the SCLC. But I can tell you, Dr. King <clears throat> was a, a, bro a, a black brother, a brother. I think some of you heard me say, I want to repeat it for the young people. Um, one day in Raleigh, North Carolina, we were getting ready for a rally at Shaw University. And my job in the SCLC was to put up the posters, the handwritten posters I was telling you about. And in Raleigh, they had rules about where to put the posters up. You can get arrested if you put the poster up pole or the wrong tree or on the wrong street. They actually had streets that you could put posters on, streets you couldn't put posters. And obviously, you could put no posters up in the white community. So we put a lot of the posters up in the black community. And one day I was putting up posters. Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy passed by and stopped. And I said, oh my God, I must put the posters up wrong. So they got out of the car. And they said, uh, you putting these posters up, Ben? I said, yes, sir. And Dr. King said, where's the hammer? Where's the nails? I said, well, I have an extra hammer. I said, well, Dr. King, I got this. He said, no, son. I'm not sending you out to put these posters up if I'm not willing to do it. He said, the quality of leadership is not to tell somebody to do something without first considering how am I going to do it? And then you get other people to follow you in doing it. I learned a lot from Dr. King that way. He was a brilliant, he had a PhD in systematic theology. And those of you who are church folks in here, you go to seminary, you get a master's degree, but everybody knows by the time you get into graduate school, 
The hardest degree is systematic theology. Why? Because it means you have to not only know about God and Jesus Christ and the Trinity and all the different philosophies. No. You have to learn the system of theology from the Greek of the New Testament, from the Hebrew of the Old Testament, and how it applies to all the scholars that have written about it since the beginning of Christianity. So, this brother, he was 20 some years old getting his PhD in systematic theology. He's a smart, bright brother. But he used his intellect, he used his training not to leave black people, but to lead black people. And today, a lot of us acquire degrees and knowledge so we can get out of the hood. And I'm not saying it's wrong not to want to leave something that may not be socially correct. That's not my point. My point is that when you get an education, you should get the best education you can get. Use your education. Use what you acquire. Use the knowledge. Use the intellect. Use the training to make some doors open for other brothers and sisters. That's the point I'm trying to make. So while Dr. King was a scholar, he also would break down his sermons in very simple terms. And he would arouse you in his speeches. And I asked him once, I said, Dr. King, how do you make these powerful speeches? You know what he told me? He said, son, I, I, I start on my conclusion first. So anybody can begin a sermon. It's how you end it up. What he meant by that, young people, you have to plan your life. Not just how you begin it, but in the wealth and the journey. Life is a journey. And we studied Dr. King's, by the time he gave, that's the picture of the 63 March. By the time he gave that speech, we now know that was not the first time he gave that I Have a Dream speech. He had given it before, once in Detroit and also once in Atlanta. So he was prepping himself. So a lot of people said, well, wow, how did this brother make this spontaneous speech like that? That speech was well planned. In seminary, they have a course called homiletics. That means they teach you how to speak, how to articulate. And Dr. King was so good in his homiletics class, the teacher used to allow him to teach the class. Communication. One thing I admire about young people today, I know you all have these devices. And I want to challenge you to use your device, not just to communicate or tweet or Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. And I know they got a lot of other stuff out there that I can't even call. But my point is, how we communicate and what we communicate about is important. It's not trivial pursuit. It is important. Denise Rollock Barnes and I, Denise is the chairman of the National Newspaper Publishers Association <laughs> and the publisher of the Washington Informer. And I'm so proud of her. We've got a strong black woman leading all these black publishers. And, and to all the sisters in here, the truth of the matter is, we would not, Dr. King would not have been able to build SCLC into a strong civil rights organization hadn't been for the role of women. Women have always been not at the fringe, but at the center of movement building. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. And I know there are a lot of theories out there about the non-role of women in the movement. That is not true. There couldn't be mass meetings in any church without the role of them sisters in the church to make that happen. And bless her soul, Coretta Scott King was a strong ally and wife to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Through thick and thin. And to a large credit, <clears throat> the reason why we have the King Center today is because even in the 
tragic tragedy of Dr. King's assassination, Coretta was determined not to allow the forces of racial hatred take over America and set up the King Center to ensure his legacy. And of all the websites, if you want to know anything about Dr. King, I would encourage you to go to thekingcenter.com because it's the most accurate. Because, you know, a lot of stuff on the Internet is not accurate. So you have to always check out your source of the information. And today the King Center has been led by uh, the Reverend Dr. Bernice King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter, strong gospel preacher, strong sister. So I encourage you, over this next period, we're getting ready to celebrate Dr. King's uh, birthday. He would have been 87 years old on January the 15th. There's going to be a march on the 18th in southeast Washington. I encourage you all to participate in the Martin Luther King march. And I, I know a lot of young people say, well, Reverend Chavis, you know, we're tired of marching. Marching doesn't change anything. And I tell people, I say, well, have you marched? Marching is therapeutic. When you step out there with other brothers and sisters who are stepping out there, it can be a transformative experience. Even if it's a short march or a long march, it's not the length. It's the, it, uh, what are we stepping for today? And we're going to step for something together. We're going to make a difference. We're going to be visible. You know, certain things you do have to raise your voice about. When it comes to your freedom, it comes to your getting justice, it comes to the liberation of our people, not only America, around the world. Yes, we've got to raise our voice. The reason why I mentioned Denise earlier, we had lunch with a brother from Cameroon today. And we were talking about how can we get black people around the world a little more together. We we're just talking about how, and we're going to be working on that. But we need the insight, and I'm glad Sim and Sam comes to introduce the panel. I really, I, I don't mind you responding to what I'm saying about Dr. King, but I want to hear from you. Because I really believe that the next round, the next lap of this relay race, we got some star athletes, known and unknown. And we have to not just be cheerleaders for them, but we have to prepare our young people to run right, to win, to excel. I had a discussion last night with a brother about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And they say, well, our young people are having problems with STEM. Well, if our young people knew that we created science, created technology, created engineering, created math, we were the first mathematicians. First architects, first astronomers, first scientists. So let anybody tell you you can't count or can't distill a molecular formula, a balance of a chemical equation. We can do that. But we have to do more. It's not so much proving something to the system. It's about allowing the manifestation and the fulfillment of our God-given gifts and talents. The worst thing in the world is to live your whole life and not maximize what you've already been given in birth, and that's life itself. That's what the Civil Rights Movement is about. That's what Dr. King was about. He empowered people with his message. He empowered people with his speeches. But more than that, he embodied his speeches, and he embodied the organization in his own life. And that is why I think today, in 2016, we have to make sure that we regenerate our sense of struggle for freedom. I want to mention something that happened this week, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, Sam, for the um, panel. President Barack Obama uh, gathered a lot of the victims of gun violence, black, white, Latino, Asian, and called for executive order on gun control. 
very controversial. I believe that African Americans, black people, we have to weigh in on this discussion. I'm a strong supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement. Strong. I'm proud of our young people. I'm proud of them. We have to do everything we can to encourage them. By the same breath, I am concerned that I don't hear enough of us share a passion, a vocal passion, about trying to stop some of the self-destruction in our own community. It's, it's, it's not about juxtaposing the two. That's not the issue. This is not about either or. When I see these young brothers in Chicago and other places taking the life of one another for no other reason than well, there is no reason. There is no justification for homicide and fratricide within the black community to be our greatest cause of death. Now, I said earlier that we have to be mindful of what's in our mind, our consciousness, our state of mind. Because the truth of the matter is, you can pass all the executive orders from the White House, or even if the Congress somehow gets religion and passes gun control, which is unlike, uh, very uh, unlikely. But even if they did all of that, I don't think the self-destruction in black communities is going to stop until black people make it stop. Now, I'm not, I, I, don't wanna, I know this is live streaming, and I want any of the listening audience to get misunderstand. I'm not letting the Congress off the hook. I'm not letting anybody off the hook. I'm trying to make us, as African Americans, step up to our responsibility. Every life, every black life matters. Not some black lives, because they're taken by a police department. All black lives matter. And we have to be very passionate about how we articulate that. But I would say this. That's one of the things I learned from Dr. King. I don't want to point fingers at our young people. Because in truth, a lot of the self-destructive things that our young people may do, they don't, they're not born that way. They learn that from us. Young people learn how to cuss from adults. I learned how to cuss from adults. I didn't know what cussing was. And I grew up, and I heard people use this language. I, you know, I didn't hear it in church, but I heard it out in the street. And I saw how people would pay attention when people would use that kind of language. So when I wanted people to pay attention to me, I started using that language. But then as I grew a little older, I realized that the language that I used, even with my buddies and my friends, was beginning to determine how I valued their lives, and, and very important, how I value my own life, lives of my family. So don't think language is not important. It is. Language is sometimes the evidence of what we are thinking, of how we are feeling. And in hip-hop, since it's aspirational, I would say language is what we aspire to. It's what we want. You know. Dr. King was more than a rhetorician. In other words, someone that knows how to use rhetoric. He used words, he used phrases, he used sermons, he used speeches. He used admonitions to engender a sense of self-responsibility, to engender a sense of, I hear you, Dr. King, but I'm going to join you. I hear you, Dr. King, 
I'm going to take some time and devote some of what I have in my life to help build this movement. So you won't have to do it by yourself, Dr. King. I'm going to join you. And that's exactly what happened. And these little small, sometimes uh, impoverished towns came some of our strongest people. Not what was in their pocket, but what was in their mind, what was in their heart, what was in their soul. You know, the reason why I agree that James Brown was the king of soul was not just because he could do the good footwork. But James Brown used his ability to sing and dance and articulate not only to uh, derive an income, but when he started talking about I'm black and I'm proud, at a time when it wasn't popular, to talk about you're black and you're proud. He was rapping back then. Gil Scott Heron, and y'all know who that is? Rapping back then. So by the time hip hop emerged in the early 1980s and 1970s, I don't want you to think it just fell out of the sky. Our cultural movements have historical antecedents. You know, Dr. King loved music. Certainly, out of the church, he loved gospel, loved spiritual. But he also loved soul music, jazz, you know, the blues. You can't come out of the Delta, Mississippi, and not know something about the blues. But the blues is about singing about not how just bad things were, but what we're going to do about it. Y'all heard of Nina Simone? I was a bad sister, and she didn't uh, restrain herself in her music or in her lyrics and her words to wake us up. Every time I see Erica Badu today, I remind her, I say, Erica, you like Nina Simone. In each generation, you know, so I'm looking at some Rosa Parks in here tonight. I'm looking at some Martin Luther King Juniors in here tonight. You know, I'm looking at some Stoker Carmichael, some Rap Browns, some Ella Bakers in here tonight. And that's why we're here, to pay tribute to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to the movement that is still very much alive. Closing point, I do not believe that this is the post-civil rights situation. I do not believe that we are in a post-racial America. I do not believe that all of what Dr. King struggled for and died for and his legacy lives for today is in vain. We have more opportunities today than ever before. Sometimes we have a little blinders on we can't see the opportunities. Man, when I was your age, I wish I'd had the internet. All that information. I would have four and five degrees. Y'all got so much information, so much access to it. Don't hold yourself back. You need to get, uh, when I ask you what your major, you tell me what your triple majors are. Major as much as you can, learn as much as you can, and then help someone else to learn as much as they can. On behalf of the living legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Thank you for listening. So Sam, Sam Collins, please come and uh, introduce the panel. We're going to get right into it. Thank you. Uh, let's give Dr. Chavis another hand. Please, let's give him a big hand, please. You know, I think it's always good. Seriously, that was, that was the lesson of all lessons. And, you know, us as uh, people of African descent, we have a lot of emotion. We're very emotional. And that can be a good thing a lot of times because that's how we're connected. 
uh, together. At the same time, it can be a very bad thing. When you let emotions get the best of you, you don't work as smarter, you know, you don't, you don't move um, calculated, you know. So I think part of this movement is understanding what happened before to understand what we have to do now. And Dr. Chavis was very right in saying that the civil rights movement, we're not in the post-civil rights movement, we are the civil rights movement, and this battle has taken thousands and thousands of years. If you go back to before 1492, everything was peachy, everything was gravy, but from 1492 on, that's when you saw a lot of colonialism across the world. That's where you saw a lot of white supremacy rearing its ugly head and taking on every facet of our lives. So it's going to take a whole lot more than marching, a whole lot more than talking to do that. And today we have panelists who are going to talk about the, the totality of Martin Luther King's legacy because the powers that be have narrowed Martin Luther King Jr. down to just marching in the I Have a Dream speech. And they have done a great disservice to us. You know, for those of us who came up in the public school system, the private school system in the 80s and the 90s, we heard about Dr. Martin Luther King, the great speech on Washington, we heard about the Civil Rights Bill, then after that you heard nothing. And then the 90s came, we were all prosperous and everybody thought that it was peachy. So then when it came to black on black crime, we blamed each other instead of seeing that black on black crime is a symptom of white supremacy and systems that Martin Luther King was trying to break down at the time of his death. That's exactly what he was trying to break down. They like the passive meek, let's march. You hit me twice and now still get up. You spit on me three times and now still get up King. They like that King. But when King started talking about economic um, disenfranchisement, when he started talking about the Vietnam War, they took him out. I'm not scared to say it. they took him out. He wasn't assassinated, he was taken out and it's on public record. Go back to 1998, they implicated the US government in his death. Kids, do your research, it's on Google right now. 1998 MLK assassination, seriously. This is serious talk, okay? Us as black people, we have no time to play. And part of not playing is studying very, very hard and understanding our leaders in its totality. Do not run away from MLK because somebody told you that he was an integrationist and he wanted to parlay with white people and he wanted to just get hit all day in the march. Do not run away from him because not hitting back when somebody hits you is the bravest thing that you can do. How many of us have been hit so many times and wanted to hit somebody back but we didn't? I know, let's talk to the kids. You've been in school, you know how it is. When somebody steps up to you, you just want to get to them so badly. And then when you do get in trouble for hitting them back, the teacher's like, well, why'd you do that? You should have just been nonviolent. And you tell them, no, I didn't want to be nonviolent. That's an understandable reaction. But MLK was smart in the sense that he wanted everybody in America to see on TV the suffering of black people who were marching peacefully. That's smarter than people always give him credit for. So today's panel discussion, today's panel discussion is an educational tool. But the question I have for you guys is that once we finish this panel discussion, what are we going to do? How are we going to carry the legacy forward? How are we going to implement these changes? And what can you do? A couple of fallacies I want to lay to rest today. All right. First of all, MLK Jr. was not the only person in the civil rights movement who put in work. That's a fallacy that they always put on us. And they put this one man on a pedestal and they tell us time and time again, be like MLK. What does that leave the rest of us who may not be able to speak in public, who may not be able to mobilize people, who may not be able to go to church and put on a nice suit and stuff like that? Where does that leave us? That type of narrative often makes many of us feel powerless because we're not the so-called exceptional. MLK was a leader in the sense, like Dr. Chavis said, that he would empower those people who were behind him. So of course he was the face, he was talking to Lyndon B. Johnson, but by no means was he the only person. You had other folks in there. So the question today is, especially for the young people, because the elders, you already know what you can do and what you have done and you're passing the baton, but to the young people, the teenagers, I'm talking to y'all because I love y'all so much, what are y'all going to do? What are you good at? Can you write? Can you sing? Are you an engineer? Are you a business person? What can you do and how are you going to use your talents to help your community? We're just a week away from Kwanzaa, at the very end of Kwanzaa. You know, you had the seven principles, Umoja, Kuchichagulia, Ujima, Ujamaa. 
uh, Nia, Kuumba, and Imani. Each principle, we're talking about African unification. We're talking about helping our own. We're talking about being race conscious, you know? If it wasn't for white supremacy, we'd still be in tribes, you know? I'd still be a gribble man or a crew man, or I'd still be Igbo or whatever else, but instead I'm a black man. It's a geopolitical designation given to me for the very fact that it's meant to hold me down in comparison to white people. So they want us to hate ourselves. They want us to not shop black. They want us to kill each other. It's all about genetic and black annihilation at the very end. And it sounds very ugly, but that's, that's the very truth of the matter. But the question is, what are you gonna do about it? What are we going to do about it? Before I introduce the panelists, I just want to get a scope of the room and see who we have in the audience. I see a very multi-generational audience. It's very few times that you see a lot of elders and young people in the room at the very same time. So my 2,000 babies, where are you at? Raise your hands. Come on, raise your hands. Let's give them a hand. 2,000 babies, what's up? Yeah, yeah, yes, 2,000 babies. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, 90 babies, where you at? 90 babies, 90 babies, okay. Let's give them a hand, let's give them a hand. All right, all right. 80s babies, where you at? 80s babies. All right, few of us, you know, we're still up here, all right. 70s babies, where you at? Yeah, 70s babies, all right. Okay, now I'm treading in the deep territory here, okay. So 60s babies and beyond, where you at? Let's give them a, all right, yeah. That's what I like, see? Man, give yourselves a hand, man, because you guys made it out in the cold. The cold came back with a vengeance. It told us it was on vacation, and then he came back. You know, he wants to keep us inside and keep us docile during the winter months, but we're still here, and we're here to fight. So let's give ourselves a hand for coming out tonight. All right, so the moment we've all been waiting for, uh, some insight from people in the community who have been doing this for a very long time, who can... Uh, offer a piece of the movement and talk about MLK's legacy holistically. All right, our first panelist, um, this is a very, very cool brother, a brother who is an elder in a sense, but is able to connect with the young people. He is an employee of the Greater DC Washington branch of the Boys and Girls Club. Let's give Mr. LeVar Jones a hand, y'all. Come up to the stage, sir. Very good brother here, and he brought a half a dozen or so children with him, you know, not children, but young people, teenagers, adolescents, man, the next um, people in the movement, let's give them a hand for coming out. On a Thursday night, too. All right, our next panelist, uh, this woman is very well versed in what it means to shop black, what it means to support black business, and she is a person who's going to paint a picture for us in terms of economic empowerment. She is a representative of the Let's Buy Black 365 movement. A question for y'all, who bought black today? Who bought black today? Well, you better buy black when you get out of here. Go to um, Ooz and Oz. Um, go to, uh, there's a shoe shine place right next to Ooz and Oz. You have IPOs on 9th Street between T and U. You have a whole lot of spots to buy black. Keep the money in the family. So let's give Ms. Nataki Cambone a hand. She is part of the Let's Buy Black 365 movement. Welcome her to the stage. Uh, you can sit right here. I'm, we're gonna, gonna keep, it. yep, great, perfect. Our last panelist, uh, this brother here, uh, he is on the media front just like myself. He is someone uh, who is, uh, a couple years my senior, a few years my senior. Uh, he is well versed in a lot, he's well read. He's keeping his mind fresh, he's on the battlefield, and he's spreading information. Information is power, but the power is, once you have that information, what are you gonna do about it? And this brother here, he feeds himself, and then he feeds other people. So, his name is Big Baba Rob, and he is part of the Black Geeks uh, show. Let's give him a hand. Native Washingtonian, still in the area, fam, you alum. Great. Well. So let me All right. So how are you guys feeling? Pretty good, pretty good, thank you. Pretty good. So I just introduced uh, each of you. If you can just give a sort of a 30 second spiel, an elevator speech kinda about uh, what you do in the community. Uh, let's start with uh, the lady first. Ms. Cambon, please just give the audience a little bit about yourself and your movement. Okay, 
Um, well, again, my name is Nataki, and <clears throat> I am a spokesperson. Closer? Okay. Uh, my name is Nataki, and I am a spokesperson and also a local DC organizer, or one of the local DC organizers for the Let's Buy Black 365 movement. This is a black economic empowerment movement that really focuses on the idea that, you know, so many times we talk about where we say, you know, we should get together and do this, and we need to do this for black people, and when are we going to do, and the list goes on and on and on. And uh, Dr. Chavis talked about, you know, sometimes people get sick of, well, when are we going to do something? So this entire movement is focused not on when are we going to, it's focused on how do I, as an individual, take the power in my own hands to, to, uh, move us forward towards black unity. And so the whole concept is I don't have to wait for us to do something. I can wake up today and identify black owned businesses in my own neighborhood and I can decide to patronize those black owned businesses. Uh, it, it's, there's a website platform that is crowdsourced where anybody can identify any black owned business in their area and share that with the community so that other people can also uh, take advantage of those businesses and resources so that we can buy black 365 days a year. Uh, I grew up in a household in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, <laughs> where buying black every day was just natural. Uh, it, you know, it was, it, was, it was just what we did. Uh, my parents were from Brooklyn, New York, and they came from a community where buying black was just natural. And so to, to come out and be in environments where uh, especially in the South, sometimes people avoid black owned businesses because we have been so brainwashed that we think, well, it, in, the, in the spirit of equality, I'm just not gonna patronize any black owned businesses, which is the exact opposite of what every other community does. It's the exact opposite of what should be our human nature. And so this whole movement is about not focusing on what we used to do, what any of that, and it's not focusing on the we in that sense. It's focusing on individual action, something that I can do to take the power back in my hands towards black economic empowerment, towards black liberation, and towards black unity. Give her a hand, y'all. That's beautiful. <laughs> Big Baba Rob, please. Um, hey, I'm Big Baba Rob. I am a host of several podcasts. First of all, representing the Black Geeks, we are a podcast casting group. We've got a number of members. Uh, we have a, uh, several incredible brothers with a depth of geek knowledge. And when we say geek, everyone like, oh, what, what, what's geek? What's this geek thing? Um, you know, let's say, what's the difference between a geek and a nerd? You know, we get all those kind of questions. To us, uh, a geek is somebody that's passionate about something. Either you're passionate about gaming, you're passionate about movies, books, uh, television. Uh, we, we've got a brother who's passionate about survival. Um, and so what we do is we come together, we have a podcast that we've been doing for a number of years now, and we talk about a number of different topics uh, from technology to books. Uh, we do book reviews, uh, movie reviews, and, and sometimes we get social as well. Um, I also represent uh, a podcast called Geeking Over 40, uh, because a lot of people think, hey, you know, aren't you too old to geek? Mm, no. How many of you guys are a level 56 fallout? I am. You know, and if you don't know what that is, it's a popular game. Oh, yeah, so you laugh, because you know, you know. And, and so it's like, but, and there are brothers and sisters out there who've been collecting comic books and cards and, and, and they watch television and, and they're online. Um, we've got brothers and sisters that are out there that do live tweets on the weekends uh, about their favorite shows and favorite televisions that they do old school. Um, you know, for those of you who remember, Soyant Green, you know, way back, science fiction from way back, yeah. And, and that's the thing is that it, it's cool to geek over 40. Uh, and so what I represent is kind of the electronic social media arm. What can we do? How can we pull this together? Because social media is big. And the blurred community, block, you know, drop a term on some of y'all, blurred black nerds, uh, the blurred community is strong. You know, everyone knows that we talk about social media all the time. You step out wrong, black Twitter comes down with a hammer. You know, and, and so in, so that in itself is a movement. And one thing that I try to do is I try to bring podcasts together. Um, like one of the podcasts, the, the Geeking Over 40, 40 podcast, I bring forth different 
people different elements of what is their specialty, whether it's comics, whether it's television. I, I'm planning a, a show this year of some of just you know 60 years worth of sci-fi knowledge. Um, and, and it's just incredible, and the conversations that we have are so deep. Um, and the thing is that there is power. We have a power. Our online presence is a power. And what we, what we do is we share knowledge. We share knowledge, we share information, and we support each other. And so that's part of that social movement that's in the electronic uh, arena. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Well, good evening again, everybody. Uh, my name is LeVar Jones, and um, for the last 18 years, I've been honored to serve as a youth advocate, a youth pastor, uh, and most recently, the team program director at the FBR Branch Boys and Girls Club located at the ARC uh, in Southeast DC. And again, I am extremely honored tonight to be joined by six of the extreme teens of FBR Nation uh, who came out with us tonight. Um, appreciate them. <laughs> my entire life, and this is January, this is National Mentoring Month, my life has been about walking with young people to help them discover who they are, who they've been called to be, the gifts that are within them. And I, I, I had a flashback moment. I see one of my other former mentees is, who is here tonight. My life has been about walking with young people, not to give them something, but to walk with them as they discover what God has put within them already. The beautiful thing about this is that there is an innate gift. There are innate gifts in each and every one of us. And I've had the pleasure of watching young people discover that through ups, downs, and everything else in between. Between. And uh, it's just a joy to be able to be here. I'm representing our, our, li our Lives Matter campaign tonight that our young people helped start over a year ago in response to the Michael Brown assassination. And we were searching for solution or searching for peace, searching for understanding. And they launched this campaign to make a declaration to the world that their lives do matter. That being from Southeast Anacostia Ward 8, East of the River, does not disqualify you from being great. It only means that your greatness is that much more in depth. And so I'm so proud of them. We've gone and traveled. their energy and their passion and their loyalty and faithfulness to what we call FBR Nation of, of our club and our space is what fuels us. It's what fueled young people in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey to want to do a summit similar to the one that they put on. And so we traveled to New Jersey in October. Um, and for them to be able to see the, the fruits of their labor and the fruits of their thoughts and their ideas come into a place where young people outside of their community are recognizing the power of their voice. We have a mural in our teen center lounge that uh, has a microphone breaking through a wall. Underneath it, it says, be heard. And that's the only message at the end of the day I want my young people to walk away with. I want you to be heard, whether it's through your voice, through your music, through your engineering, through your acting, through your uh, medical field, through whatever it is that your photography, nursing, whatever it is that they choose to do, that they let their voices and their lives be heard, which I think is a direct testament to Dr. King. Definitely, definitely. So, so there you have it, uh, an astounding panel. We're going to get right into it. My first question, any one of you feel free to take the mic uh, first. Um, MLK holiday has been celebrated since uh, the 80s pretty much. Uh, if you can give a theme for the 2016 MLK holiday, you know, this being the first of many events for the MLK holiday, if you can give a theme for 2016 in celebrating MLK's legacy, what would it be? I can take that one. Uh, did, okay. uh, so the the Let's Buy Black 365 movement, um, the way it works is individuals all around the country, uh, anyone can decide, I want to be an organizer of this movement. I might do like music, I might do um, arts or entertainment. Uh, we've got a spoken word contest right now for youth who want to talk about econo economic empowerment through um, either hip hop, spoken word, or, or, um, or poetry. So there are all different kinds of ways that this works because one of the things that has to happen is, is with all of our movements, we have to be holistic. 
you know, we can't leave out one aspect of ourselves. We have to address everything from health to entertainment to, uh, to media to all of these things. And so uh, because of that, I think one of the reasons this movement has been so amazing to work with is that the organizers from around the country, when we get together in this you know, brain trust, you get the most amazing concepts to come forward. And so one of the concepts that, that we're doing, so kind of letting the cat out of the bag because we're not supposed to really talk about it too much yet, but one of the concepts that we're doing uh, for this year uh, is no more dreaming. So there is the Dr. King, Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream speech that took place on August 28th, 1963. And we're all familiar with that speech and mainstream media beats it over our heads every year. And so what we're saying this year is we actually don't want to talk about the I Have a Dream speech. We want to talk about his mountaintop speech that happened on April 3rd, 1968, five years later where he said, he actually said, this is not about protesting or marching and demonstrating. What we need to do is pool our dollars and, and take individual action to spend money to strengthen black-owned businesses and black-owned institutions. So I think the theme for this year, uh, in light of everything that's going on, you know, the, the injustice in our community, the way to stand up against that injustice is to decide I am going to spend money with businesses that are committed to developing the black community. And when I do that, those businesses can in turn influence the political process. And so if we're talking about action, and, and this whole movement is about no talk, just, I mean, not just talk, take action. What actions can I take? Then I would, I, I would say that's what this needs to be about. And if you have not heard that, you can go to our YouTube page. Um, that uh, his, the full speech is on that. It's about 43, 44 minutes. And every word of it, especially for young people, uh, you know, I've talked to, to a lot of young people who say, yeah, I've heard Dr. King's speeches. And you know, they really feel like they, they disconnected from it because it doesn't feel like it speaks to them because there is really this need to not just you know, hear about uh, everything from a, from a passive beat down approach. It's, you know, okay, I've heard it, now what can I do about it? And so this speech and this movement and this year focusing on individual action is what we can do about it. If I could kind of pick up kind of where you left off, uh, if I had to pick a title, I would say it would be We Are the Struggle. And the reason I say that is partially because of the incredible rise of the Black Lives Movement and to see these young people out here in the streets willing to put themselves out there uh, where Dr. King and Dr. Chavis have been. Um, we haven't seen that in a really long time. And there was a period where you kind of mentioned, we got, we got solved, we got comfortable, you know? I mean, I'm thankful, you know, you, you and I got together because of Dr. Welsing, you know, and, and, you know, I look back at my life and I realized that if, you know, my parents didn't talk about the struggle, you know, they, they, they said, oh, you know, you got to be better. But I didn't have the concept of the struggle. It was books, um, you know, it, it, was, it was the ISIS papers, it was Ivan Van Sertima, you know, it was things that I found and I realized, oh, crap, you know, there, there's, a, there's a struggle out here that is, is way before me. And I think that there's been a disconnect, that 80s and that 90s period where we, we, were had, we had money and people arrived, had the big house, had the big car. They stopped talking about the struggle. So there was a period where it wasn't passed down effectively because they thought that they had arrived. And then this term post, post-racial, come on now, there's, there's nothing post-racial yet. You know, there, there's still economic slavery. There is still educational um, disparities. Uh, eco uh, look at it, careers, jobs, availability, training. Uh, there's, just, uh, there's so many disparities between just along racial lines. And let's not even talk about justice. You know, is justice or is it just us? You know, because it, it seems to be it's just them and it's not us. So I, I think we are the struggle. I, I, I love that as a title because it's a reminder, it's not done. There is still a whole lot of work to do. 
because you know, I had a friend of mine on uh, on Facebook said, um, "Hey, you know, I don't understand. Why can't it be all lives matter?" Well, I said the problem with all lives matter is that it takes into account that all lives are equal. You, they aren't. The disparities are just too large. So I, that that would be mine. It's going off of yours. We we are the struggle. And we've got to continue, and it's got to be passed down, and we have to continue until the level of equality at least comes close. Because right now, we're not even close. I think I would, the only thing I would piggyback, and I'm in a total agreement uh, to Dr. Chavis's point, <clears throat> there has to be an awakening of each of us individually. And so I would add in my theme would be stand up. And I think in this last year, we saw young people, we saw people of all backgrounds stand up. And again, it, it has been a while since we've had this, this groundswell and this energy, this movement build to this level, but we watched uh, a whole nation of people stand up, and I think we need to continue that. I think where we lose the essence of Dr. King's uh, speeches, his words, and in particular, the I Have a Dream speech, and I, I, this, this particular set of words is very near and dear to me. I was introduced to it in the third grade at Burville Elementary School in Northeast DC, Dean Wood section, where at uh, age seven and a half, Shaddam Moses looked at me and said, you're gonna learn the speech and stand in front of the audience at the Black History Program and deliver it. So I was littler than I am now and stepped up two steps on the podium. She said, wait until everybody stops talking. I waited and at, at a third grader began to understand the power of words and, and where we miss the essence of what it means to dream, at some point after you dream, you wake up. The dream doesn't, you just, you, the, you think about the dream that you've had that was really good. At some point you wake up and you enjoy the moment of that dream and it spawns you on to do something else. It's time for us, if we haven't already, to, to wake up. The dream is great, and the pictures are there. The vision is cast. It's time for us to wake up and stand up. So I would add that to theme for this year. All beautiful responses. Uh, let's give them a hand. Uh, just <laughs> and as we can clearly see, each theme is pretty much, it's not, it's not necessarily the one right answer. It's one piece of a big puzzle, and we are human beings we have brains, we can do stuff simultaneously. So it's not about, okay, if I just shot black, I can't wake up at the same time, or I can't stand up, or I can't spur into action. You can do all of them. It's very, exactly, it's very holistic. You know, and moving, in, moving along in the theme of being holistic, I wanna uh, turn the conversation over to social media. Uh, earlier, Dr. Chavis made a very great point about us having a lot of resources, but just not really being able uh, I'm not going to partial words at all, but it's to the effect that during the time of your adolescence, stuff took a whole lot longer to happen. So instead of using the word processor, you had to actually do stuff page by page. Well, for us today, spreading the word about an event is um, just as easy as typing something up and putting it over social media, you know. But as we know, you know, that pretty much is not, that's not the end all be all. So if you can just reflect on your experiences as organizers and people spreading knowledge, how have you been able, have, first, have you thought about moving beyond social media, you know, using it as part of your total organizer strategy? And if you have, what else have you done in addition to social media? I'll, I'll pick up on the social media piece since, I, <laughs> since my phone is sitting here like, I know they're tweeting about me. Uh, I was like, okay, guys, I, I, I'm, okay. Um, yeah, social media is, it's very obvious that it's become such a power. We get instantaneous organization and communication. Um, for me, it is, it's key. It's key to what I'm doing. It's key to the way that we communicate. Um, yes, the answer is we have looked at going offline. We are looking at doing events where we can come together as people and not just usernames, uh, of, of moving beyond that um, it, with, within that geek blurred spectrum. Um, because we understand that it's one thing to be a username and, and to, you know, give a commentary or an idea within 140 characters, but when you pull together people as a force, and, and I'll give you a, a one example of that. Uh, some time ago, uh, about a year ago, uh, there was this movie, 
and I don't like to talk about this movie because it's kind of a bad word. There's this movie called Exodus. And it was one of the most offensive things that, that I had seen in a while. Because how in the world are you going to tell an Egyptian story with all Caucasian people in it? And only, and the black people were only soldiers, thieves, and it was something else. But they weren't, if you looked at the list on IMDb, you didn't see the black people until you got down to thief. And it was, a, it was an absolute travesty. So what we do is we use social media to say, look, guys, we're going to get this hashtag, and we'll get this hashtag trending. And then people see it. And what happens is news organizations, because of the 24-hour news cycle, say, hey, this hashtag is trending. But what happens is we can use that hashtag as an organizational method to say, we're going to boycott this movie. We're not going to go see this movie. And we're going to talk about it on our shows. We're going to talk about it in our tweets. And we're going to let them know we're not going to just let you try to steal our history. And I, had, and I was hashtagging probably for that whole day saying, not on my watch. Taking, taking personal responsibility like, you don't get to take my history. I'm not standing for that. So that's one way that I've leveraged you know, social media to be able to have a movement where you can get people. Because what happens is the only way we're ever going to get these movie companies to respect us and respect our history is to hit them in the pockets. It's all about money. Because if you make a movie for uh, $100 million and you only clear $20 million after five weeks, that's a loss. And at some point, they've got to get the idea that you don't get to, rep take the, to, to misrepresent us. You don't, you don't get to have my history. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not as long as I have a voice. Not as long as I have an option and a way. So that's one way we use social media to organize and mobilize people to affect change. And that sort of speaks to uh, MLK's, uh, well, the Montgomery bus boycotts, as a matter of fact. You mentioned taking our dollars away. And so that's a very nice parallel. Uh, LeVar, uh, Nataki, and I mean, it's, it's the new poster. It's the new button. It's the new, uh, you look at this picture, and I think back to the stories that I've heard from my elders in terms of how the word moved. You know, Dr. Chavis talked about, you know, the, the hand press and, the, and, and getting the word out. What we have to realize is that, you know, nothing new is under the sun. It is, it is our newest way of connecting people. But again, we have to use that as a tool to spawn language, spawn conversation, spawn a movement. Uh, it has to be more, it ha cannot just live in that space. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've seen, I know for instance with uh, with our hashtag, and we, we hashtag all over the place. I think, it, again, you know, the, the teams, we have a media crew. Uh, Erica is our captain of our media crew. A couple of our teams here are members of that. You know, we hashtag all the time. And what it does, again, is it, it connects. It connects you. This is how we were able to go to Jersey and take this message and this movement there because the teens in Jersey saw the hashtag. And so now what you have is you have this, uh, I remember in elementary school there was something uh, called Flat Stanley. I don't know if anybody remembers Flat Stanley. So you made a little Flat Stanley of, of, of uh, construction paper and all the students signed it and you stuck it in an envelope and you sent it to a school in Massachusetts or in some other part of the country. But it connected you. And I think with all of our, with that gap that we had where we fell off, where we stopped teaching, where we stopped learning, where we stopped loving, where we stopped shopping, we stopped supporting one another, we disconnected our ourselves. That blame can't go on anybody else. We disconnected ourselves. We allowed ourselves to be disconnected. And so now we have to take some ownership in reconnecting ourselves. And I think as we're doing that, that light bulb is coming on for a lot of people. Oh, I didn't know that this was happening. I didn't know you felt this way. I didn't know that you thought this way. I think that way too. And as people start to get connected, this movement starts to gain not only strength, but it starts to sustain itself. And so we find that, again, the technology piece is there to connect us, to strengthen us, and it gives some feet and some teeth to this movement as well. Yeah, uh, I, again, in total agreement with, um, with everyone who's spoken, and, and with, with the advent of Facebook groups, there are a lot of people who have used uh, Facebook to, to organize like-minded people to begin having discussions. And one of the things that we've talked about is, you know, it's, it's one thing to sit online and click like or to retweet, uh, but in order to be a people who is connected, uh, who, who can make advancements, 
we can't just be usernames and, and hashtags. We have to get offline and connect with each other. And so that's, you know, in terms of the Let's Buy Black 365 movement, it is about, you know, having an online space. Um, there's a, it is a black owned social network component, but it's also getting offline because we can't, you know, we, we cannot continue to allow uh, technology and all these other barriers to keep us from having conversations. And, and that's what they are doing. Um, so, you know, forums like this are, are fantastic. And something Dr. Chavis said earlier that, that really resonated with me is uh, we often get told the lie that, you know, you have to pick a group. But there's no reason that you have to pick a group there are multiple groups doing powerful things. And maybe your contribution to one is $5, and maybe your contribution to another is your talent, and maybe your contribution to another is your physical presence. You can be, we, we're a holistic people. You know, we don't have to be fractured and segmented and, and told that, you know, I can't do anything. Uh, there's several groups where I might ev never be a card-carrying member, but if they're doing something that I believe in, I can, I can do something to help that organization because what they're doing helps me, it helps my people, it helps my children and grandchildren. All, all great, sorry, <laughs> technology for you. All great responses. I want to uh, follow up with another question about social media. Earlier, you guys mentioned reaching out to other groups. As you can already see with social media, it forms clusters. So with me being who I am, I don't have to listen to an opposing view anymore. I can just find people who support my view. And in doing so, my view of the world becomes more um, fishbowl-like or more, or more isolated. So I'm not open to learning at all. You know, um, in getting off social media, how have you been able to engage people who might not necessarily be in line with your philosophy people who aren't in this room tonight, who would rather be doing something else, who aren't quite, quote unquote, woke yet. You know, one of the social media is that anonymity. Um, it, it's actually a double-edged sword because it gives people carte blanche to think that they can say whatever they want to say without really, really any, any repercussions. Um, and, and I think that, and, you know, we, we call them trolls. Um, you know, and they, they say vile things, but it also gives you the opportunity to counter. And, so, and you can choose to either come back and try to explain your point. Uh, you can, you can, if you don't want to stew it in 140 characters, you can go it on Tumblr and then post it on Twitter, um, which some people do. Um, I can tell you that I, I surround myself with a, a lot more, a lot of like-minded people. It's very rare that I actually run into people that I have to take the time to, to school, if you will. Um, if anything, you know, we can do it online, we can do it on the show. Um, so, but it's interesting because, because of the timeline, people can go back and read and read up on things and actually take the time to change their opinions on something. Because, or they engage you, I've had people engage me, can you tell me about this? What was this about? What are you about? Um, are you black geeks? Does that mean you're not for white geeks? Well, that's up to you, watch the show. <laughs> if you listen to the show, if you don't like what you hear, then you can jump off. Um, so I would say that we're really transitioning uh, with, with being black geeks and geeking over 40. Um, that I can tell you that when there are cons, there are meetups. Other when uh, my black geek brothers went to a recent con, they got together, uh, they got a chance to see people. Um, not as many people they probably would have liked to see. Um, but I've seen other organizations uh, like Black Girl Nerds or uh, the, the Nerd Element and, and met up with uh, one of the Nerd Element folks at, a, at the con here in D.C., awesome con. Um, and so we, we get to meet people and we get to collaborate and we get to talk about uh, pushing ourselves forward as a group, as an organization. I want to think to something that, that, that you said about, uh, about economics. Um, there's a little shop down in Mount Rainier called Sweet Natural. Love, uh, you know, love the joint. Um, it, and you can get a dinner there for about, what, 11 bucks, 12 bucks? I may not have 11 or 12 bucks, but what I realize is that if I don't patronize them, they're gonna be gone. And so, I, you know, if I'm in the area, I try to spend my money with them. You because it, 
yeah, but I want the nuggets and the mac and cheese and the collards. And you know? Black <laughs> owned and vegan. Yes. And, and so, and that's the thing is that that's how we have to think is that we have to realize that our, our money is very important. If we don't spend our money in the places where we want to be, they're gonna be gone. They won't be there without our support. So that's why it is important to come offline and not just be a hashtag and actually show up places and spend our money in the venues where we, where we want you know, to, to have in our community. It's very important that we spend the economic piece. Yeah, um, one thing that comes to mind uh, sorry, three things come to mind, so let me try and, and, and be brief. Uh, you know, when we, unfortunately, we always, because of the, of the brainwashing that we have experienced, uh, we always have to compare what other communities to ours because we are not, again, naturally doing what, what we do. And other communities, uh, you know, you never hear Chinese people talking about their unemployment rates. You never hear them talk about you know, the prices in their stores may be higher than other places. That these are things people naturally do. And it's because I might, you know, by me going to Sweet and Natural and patronizing a sister who is providing healthy options that are delicious, very delicious, <laughs> um, in the community, you know, let's say everybody in this room every night, and we did that every night. How many jobs does that create? Yeah. Exactly. So, and how much does that help that institution become an institution, go from a small business to an institution and a place where maybe somebody in this room or somebody's child in this room can then become the CEO of a, a business that started small but grew because we patronized it. That's what, you know, when you think of it that way, Everything we do in this country, every time we spend our money, every time we get offline and do something in our community, there's an economic undercurrent, whether we realize it or not. And that's why this is all about individual empowerment, because everything you do can have a lasting ripple effect on, on, on businesses, on the future of jobs, on the futures of communities, on future of politics. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be that you know you have you know we talk about the 1.2 trillion dollars that we spent as black people last year you know most people myself included really can't even conceive of that i did not have 1.2 trillion dollars last year by any stretch of the imagination but i did have the money that i had and i chose to spend it with all black owned businesses many that are growing now and i can even sit back and take some pride in what little amount you know, I contributed to help with that success. When they hire someone who looks like me, I can take pride in that. When they uh, give money back to an to a independent black owned school, I can take pride in that. And that's what we have to start doing. And that's why getting offline is, is absolutely vital and critical. I, I'll just add, you know, I think uh, to your original point, uh, a big part of having the option to listen or not listen to those who are naysayers to what you're saying is again, you know, using social media to connect and, and strengthen uh, the network that you have. And we, we took some of our teams to a leadership retreat, and one of the facilitators shared the quote, you know, that your network, your net, your network is your net worth. And so, really understanding and using, you know, social media as a way to connect with people that build up your message, build up your focus, um, that you know, if you do run into those trolls that are there, that it does only shape you. Scripture tells you always, always be ready for a defense, to defend the hope that is within you. So yeah, it does give you the opportunity to practice and shine up you know, that iron and be able to really restate who you are and what you are. But again, and, and even for those who are not sure, I think that discovery conversation can be equally as powerful. But again, using that social media as a way to build up our, net, uh, our network and one of the things, and the teams will tell you, we, uh, we have mock social networking mixers where we teach them the art of communication and put them in the room with adult professionals from various backgrounds. And I always end my comments before they start to the adult professionals, don't take it easy on them. I want them to be able to be in a room and in a space and be able to say, this is who I am, this is what I represent, this is what I do, because in that vein, they can then start creating doors that they can open for 
for themselves and for other people instead of waiting for someone to open the door for them. Beautiful. A common thread in all their responses, as you guys probably have noticed, is that they're equipping their fellow men and women for independence, pretty much. This movement is going to be one of self-sufficiency from what these people are saying. So if we're supporting each other, I'm not giving you a fish so I can give you a fish tomorrow and tomorrow. I'm giving you the platform you need to fish for yourself eventually. And that's what MLK, in my opinion, would have wanted us to do. A couple more questions um, on my part before we open it up to the audience. Uh, the fight during the 1960s was for uh, civil rights. Uh, we met, we, we, we uh, went past the separate but equal. We got uh, equal, we got um, a chance to integrate the schools. We got to integrate businesses. Um, voting rights were established for the most part, you know, even with some pushback. Um, 30 years later, well, about 50 years later or so now, what is next on, um, on this social justice journey, pretty much? What is the end game for our generation as you see it? You know, if, it, if you can just reflect on that for a second and just think about one or two tangible things that you think we should try to attain in this leg of the movement. I, I know for me, the, the initial one, and as, uh, as I'm looking at some of my young people who are on the cusp of voting age, is that if we do not wake up and stand up and understand what is happening to our voting rights across the country, even as they are siphoned off in little pieces. And if you notice, there is no big media spread about what is being taken away from us. Um, it's in little pieces. And that's so that we will miss them if we are not awake and engaged. But if we do not do that, then we will never be able to change the systems because our people will not be able to vote. Our people will not be educated about the political system. We'll still be standing on the outside, looking at it, trying to figure it out versus understanding it, voting in it, and then inserting ourselves in that process, having more elected officials, having more engaged people in the process, holding officials accountable, showing up at every meeting like we show up for the iPhone, like we show up for the Jordans, like we show up for everything else that matters in our community, we will show up um, and not when something happens. We will stop being reactionary people and show up when little Johnny gets shot and tell the mayor, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. But from day one, when you ask for my vote, I'm going to hold you accountable at that point, whether you get the office or not. So I think that for me, immediately, voting rights and understanding the political system and structure is critical because it's in that place where the power and the shifting, all of that lies. And if we are not careful, we're going to, again, be on the outside, trying to count the jelly beans in the jar in order to vote, trying to pass the test in order to vote, trying to do all of these other things that, that Dr. King and, and Dr. Chavis and all of our elders fought for. We're going to be back in the same position that we were in before if we do not wake up to that piece of the puzzle. If, if I could piggyback on your comment for a second before I give my answer to your response. I get very irritated with people who say they don't vote. Now, far be it for me to tell you what you have to do. That's not my job to tell you what you have to do. But here's my thing about voting. Somebody bled for you to vote. Somebody marched for you to vote. Someone got you know, attacked by dogs, sprayed with hoses, just so that you had the right to vote. How dare you? sit here and say that you're not going to vote. Imagine if it was you. Just, just flip, flip it around. If you say, you know, I'm going to run out there and I'm going to fight and I'm going to march and I'm going to put my body on the line, my family on the line, my job on the line for, so that you can have something. And then you fast forward 30 years later, oh, thanks for doing that. I'm not interested. You know, so for me, I, I remember the, the, as soon as I was old enough to vote in D.C., I voted. Because I, I understood that connection and understood someone did something so that I had, could have that right. And I think that's what a lot of, there's that disconnect. 
that, that people don't see, and especially when we've got to pass that down to the generations and continue to pass the struggle down, is that they understand that they're, it's still all connected. Someone did something so that you could do what you're doing now. And we've, we, we've got to continue to pass that on. So you, to answer your question, what's the end game? One of my favorite statements is to leave something better than the way you found it. And no matter what it is, um, whether it's the young people, whether it's the economy, whether it's, it's jobs, whether it's uh, access to loans, I mean, obviously the big piece right now is just equal treatment is that the laws that apply to a white man carrying an assault rifle down the middle of a street because they have an open carry permit apply to the same as if it was a Black Lives protester with an AR-15 in an open carry. Because as we've seen, YouTube has been great at showing us the disparity where one is just, hey, hey man, what you doing with that rifle there? Where the other one is, get down on the ground, I'm about to shoot you. It's not equal. It's not equal, and so I think what we, uh, in my opinion, the end game is to energize the movement. We as, uh, uh, as, you know, as the elders, we have to inspire and we have to support, whether it's financially, whether it's just sharing of knowledge, we have to continue to support the movement if we can't be there. And we have to continue to make sure that the movement can move forward. Um, and we can't um, be on a high horse they say, oh, I already sit and did that. You know, you can just go out and do it. I think it is important that we continue to, to give to that level, to give to that grassroots effort in any way, shape, and form that we possibly can. But we've got to leave it better than we found it, bottom line. Whether it's the schools, whether it's access to medical care, uh, whether it's uh, you know, jobs, we've just got to leave it better than we found it. And I say that and leave it very broad because everyone has something that they're good at. Some people are good at writing, some people are good at communicating, some people uh, are good at being an entrepreneur and, and creating jobs. So when I say leave it better than you found it, that's a personal message to you to say, what am I good at, and how can I make this better than the way that I found it? Okay. Um, so I think the end game, just like I, I mentioned before, everything being holistic, everything you know, being almost multi-dimensional, multi um, the, the principle of Kwanzaa Kuumba speaks directly to, to what uh, Baba just said. So the, a lot of people get Kaumba confused because it's creativity. And they think, okay, so for the Kaumba section of Kwanzaa, we're gonna do some kind of performing arts related thing. But the principle actually states that you are to leave your community more beautiful and more beneficial than when you inherited it. And so I think the end game, whether you celebrate Kwanzaa or not, is you know if we look at what all the principles of Kwanzaa stand for, uh, unity, self-determination, meaning standing up for ourselves and speaking up for ourselves, uh, uh, Ujima, uh, cooperative, uh, excuse me, collective work and responsibility, so working together, U Ujima, cooperative economics, meaning that we are uh, building our businesses and profiting from them together, both financially and culturally and socially in a number of other ways. Um, we have, um, I'm blanking, Nia. Uh, purpose, where we have to say what is our purpose for ourselves and for our families and for our communities and for our people. Uh, Kaumba, I just mentioned, and then Imani, faith. Uh, and that, again, is confused with religious and spiritual faith, but it's really, the, if you look at what the principle states, it's faith in ourselves, faith in our, our elders, our children, our ancestors, um, and also the faith in the righteousness and victory of our struggle. So whether you celebrate Kwanzaa or not, those are all principles that really resonate with everyone um, throughout the diaspora who is black or uh, of African descent. Uh, and so I think the end game is really to, uh, to, to go back to something the brother said, you know, we have to stop being reactionary. And I think a lot of people are waking up to that fact. And it's not about, something happened to us or our community and I'm gonna to react to it. It's, I'm gonna put things in motion so that I, so that things are not even, at, we're, we're not always in defense or defensive mode. 
And again, to bring everything full circle, if I am spending my dollars with a black owned business, uh, we, have a, we have one of our strategic partners, uh, or actually two of our strategic partners. One is uh, Freedom Paper Company. They're a bathroom, they're one of the few black owned manufacturers and distributors in the country and they make bathroom tissue, which is something everyone in the country can use. So they have committed to um, doing a case study almost where they're gonna show how people patronizing that company, how those funds are used to create jobs and to give back to the community and, how, and, and so we can actually track how, how they grow and how community grows along with them. Alpha Office Supplies, same concept. Uh, and, and another strategic partner, Comprotax, is training young people. And so when we really look at what the end game is, that's the whole reason that businesses and, and individuals um, you know, buy stock and grow companies. It's so that their children and their communities can have legacies and can have stability. And so everything we're talking about is all connected to the same thing. And the end game is how do I become the solution and say, I am the movement. I am the solution to the problem. I am the solution for my people. And that's the end game where instead of, you know, always looking back, it's today is January 7th. Yes, today is January 7th. I'm looking ahead. How am I going to say, you know, the true way to celebrate Kwanzaa is not to just go to a Kwanzaa event and sing and dance and do all that kind of stuff. The true way to celebrate Kwanzaa is you reflect on the principle for that day and you look at what you did every day or throughout the year to exemplify that principle. And if you didn't do anything, you're not really celebrating Kwanzaa. So if we're talking about not being reactionary, then the end game should be today on January 7th and tomorrow when I wake up, I'm gonna look at how I am a solution for black people in America and throughout the diaspora today, tomorrow, and in the future. Ashe, let's give them all a hand for those beautiful, beautiful responses. So I have one last question before we open it up to the audience and this one is just I have to touch on this because to some extent, all of you touched on voting rights and uh, just citizenship and civic engagement in general. And LeVar, you talked about the young people being more um, civically engaged and educated in the voting process. So as many of us know, some of us might not know this, you know, um, people coming into political power sometimes depend on more than the vote. When you're talking about lobbying groups, you're talking about money, you're talking about campaign dollars coming from certain people, and you're talking about politicians being beholden more to those corporations than the actual voters. And then you're talking about gerrymandering. For those of us who don't know what gerrymandering is, that's when um, politicians, they pass laws and they break up majority black voting districts to dilute the black vote and dilute the power pretty much. And not to mention what you mentioned earlier, the abolishment of uh, Article 4 of the Voting Rights Act that pretty much left um, the red states to do their own thing pretty much, right? So if we are to actually use the vote and make sure that it works in our favor, what say you to that? And how do we better educate our children and our adults too? to better understand the voting game holistically so that politicians aren't coming to us every four years asking us for a vote when they haven't done anything. How can we use this knowledge to someday bolster our own candidate, a black candidate, someone who's in office? Because not to rag on Obama, but the last eight years haven't been so favorable to us. When we, could, when we should have been on his front doorstep at the very beginning, we fell back because we said, that's our brother. We're not going to do anything. When instead, we should have been at the doorstep the entire time, actually using our vote to our advantage. So what say you to that in terms of just um, mobilizing people and keeping them engaged and actually understanding the entire game holistically? How do we do that? 
I think the the first thing, and I I gotta I have to brag on my own a little bit and applaud. I know they've had a a long day, but for teenagers to be engaged this evening, I'm I'm and I told Sam earlier, I'm never uh, I'm never shocked by the greatness that they exude, but I'm always in awe of it. Uh, but I think we start with moments like this where we have to educate, we have to have forums where we talk about it, where we have to go back to the Boys and Girls Club and talk about it. We have to go into you know, our community spaces and we have to, we got to bring our young people there. If that doesn't work, in addition to doing that, we got to go to them. We got to create spaces and relationships. Again, I talk about, you know, the, the power and the emphasis of mentoring. You cannot expect a young person to go do what you have not walked with them and shown them uh, to show, show them how to do and what they have not first seen you do. Our young people will tell you all the time, I'm, I'm not going to do what you don't do. You know, it's the old adage of do as you are told and not as not as what you see. And so we've got to we've got to get, you know, uh, educational opportunities like this to where our young people are, not just our young people, because there's some of us who are seasoned in our community that are ignorant to this as well. So we've got to educate our community, our family, the village, our people. And once we do that, we've got to start mobilizing. We've already talked about the $1.2 trillion of, of buying power that we've had. We've talked about black Twitter and the social media power that we have. We need to start shifting these so that we can use utilize them as tools to get people organized, identifying the causes in the community where you live and where you work and where you serve and allowing those people who are now open-minded to this to go out and start uh, learning the process, learning who the officials are, learning how the uh, the processes in, in each individual community work. And so as we do that, we then train people to be uh, on the front line, watchdogs of what's going on. And while we're knowing that we are then inspiring people who are, are who are growing up in that young people that can become those politicians that are not bought by other uh, lobbying agents and, and bought by other industries but that will be true to our causes be true to our needs be true true to our voices so I think as we, we've said it all night Education is power, knowledge is power. It starts there. We gotta have more of these moments where we can educate ourselves and we have to hold ourselves accountable to doing what needs to be done after this. Sam, you said it earlier. Is the march is great, the, the protest is great. What are you gonna do after that? What are you gonna do after the dream is over? So we gotta have more of these moments to educate and mobilize our folks into our communities. Um, looking at it from uh, let the social media aspect, electronic aspect, I think that you can kind of almost hold people accountable to a degree. Like, you know, hey, who voted? Who voted? Did you vote it? Did you vote? Did you vote? Um, and I'll give you an example of how we can leverage that, especially as black podcasters. Um, and, you know, I'm starting to see, and I'm so very inspired that um, I've connected with so many different podcasts from, you know, Afro Nerd Radio, Black Girl Nerds, Black Tribbles. Um, so many black podcasts out there that people are listening to, Geek Soul Brother and Five Nerdy Venoms. Um, in the black geeks, uh, and what happens is if we can say, hey guys, we're gonna spend, hey, we wanna really get a good voting push out. Hey, how about we all agree on a certain date, a certain time, or a certain week when we do our show, let's talk about voting for the first five minutes. This is how we can leverage social media to get the word out there to remind people that we're gonna vote. Because you've got some people who have you know, 13,000 followers, 15,000, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 followers. And then within their followers, there's some people who have celebrities who have a million followers or you know, six digit followers. And if, you can, if they retweet it and they get it out there, they say, hey, I voted. Basically, we're talking about leading by example and holding people accountable. Um, and then there's the aspect of then communicating with the politicians through social media because they have usually social media arms or representatives to find out where do they stand on this. And as we know, we're trying to get a politician uh, you know, some seasoned ones to answer a straight question is very, very difficult. Uh, I, I sometimes watch Meet the Press and other shows on Sundays. Um, it, it's always very interesting just to see how they maneuver around. Uh, but thing is that social media gives us an opportunity to interact with them on a level to get an understanding of what they do. Bernie Sanders has done an incredible job interacting with people online and answering questions and actually coming up with solutions. He was one of the first to you know, start to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and, but that's because they were taking over his 
you know, his, his, his things. But, you know, people need to understand what's happening with uh, voter suppression laws, identification laws, um, electronic voting, um, redistricting. I mean, the last, the last general election was incredible what they saw. Only five machines running an entire precinct, having to turn people away. Voting is under attack because that is where the power is. There's a lot of power and we can, you can control the people who actually are making the laws and, and guiding the country. And it's very obvious, because it's very obvious that they're scared because of the changes that they're making to make sure that there's some little loophole. Um, oh, I've moved your district over now. You're now over on the other side of the street. And, and, and even let, let's even go all the way to the conversation of why are we still voting on Tuesdays? Why aren't we voting on Saturdays? You know, I mean, there are just so many different avenues of it, and, and the voting is so very important. But social media can be such a great tool for communicating with candidates, understanding uh, what their roles are, and mobilizing people, even to say, hey, let's all go vote. We're, uh, we're all geeks and blurs in the DMV. We're all going to go vote at, at 3 o'clock on Tuesday, and we're going to show our strength. We can do that through, that, through social media arms. Um, I, I, I think the, the ideas that were shared were, were, were wonderful. Um, I would just add to that. Uh, I joined a movement uh, called I Am One of the Million, and uh, you can go to their website, IamOneOfTheMillion.com, I think is, is, uh, is the website. And the entire movement is based on, you know, a lot of people are not voting and, and, and don't see the point because it has not worked <laughs> in, 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 in some capacities. And so people, you know, get disillusioned. I, you know, I'm trying and trying and it's not working, so I'm not, not going to try. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, to some extent, it's not, it's not even uh, an, intentional, an intentional disrespect of those of us who, who lived and died for the right to vote. I think it's really the feeling of powerlessness. And so I brought up the I am one of the million group because the entire platform uh, for that group is, you know, the way other groups uh, and, and businesses or, or entities or lobbyists make headway, come together as a collective in advance, not just as a voting block, but they come with an agenda that that politician has to effectively agree to to advance once they get elected. One of the things that we have not done as a people uh, and, and what this movement is really focused on is we've come together in blocks, but we haven't asked for anything. And then the person gets in office and it's like, oh, hey, wait, by the way. And they're like, hey, you know, <laughs> the, the whole time I was campaigning, everybody else was asking for stuff and I've already set up what I'm gonna do for them and now you're coming late to the game because you didn't even understand the political process and I really can't help you. So I, you know, if we're looking at the, the politics and, and the way things need to change differently, it goes back to, you know, the reason I brought up the, the companies that are strategic partners wasn't just to say, hey, these are strategic partners, but when you have strong business enterprises that can pull resources and those and 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 the resources that they can pull uh, can affect politics and they can do some things for us you know again it goes back to the fact that I don't have 1.2 trillion dollars but maybe there's a corporate entity that has the same vision for black America that I have and I can give my money to them to buy bathroom tissue or office supplies or get my taxes done or buy you know, body products, that's why that is significant. And so we have to, again, go back to the holistic approach to how we address everything because, again, it goes back to the whole concept, everything we do is political. There, and, and the last point I'll make is there's a, uh, an economic term called opportunity cost. Every time you make one decision, by definition, you're, you're, you're not making a million other decisions. I'm here, and so the opportunity, you know, is I'm not anywhere else. There are a million other places I can be. And so we have to think about that in terms of every move and decision and dollar we spend, every place we go, the information we even take into our minds. You know, if you're listening to ignorant music, then that's 
positive, affirming, culturally relevant information you're not listening to. And so, you know, when, when we look at the political process, we have to look at how am I engaging with my community and what, I, and what my community needs so that we can get to that point. Let's give them another hand. Before we wrap up, I'm going to take two questions, one from an elder and one from a young person, and I'm going to kindly ask that one of you answer each question. So I'm going to ask one elder and one young person to just come um, right here and just ask a question, or stand up wherever you are. All right, so, yeah, uh -huh. that is so true. Yeah, uh, let, sure. person who wants to take that on? I would say, I think that we've kind of said it was around the time where we got comfortable around the, the time of prosperity. Um, I would say that was somewhere between the 80s and 90s. I think if, if I was to say, because the 70s were still very active, I think politically. Um, especially coming out of the strong movement of the 60s. Uh, so I think that what happened is uh, we went through a time of, of prosperity and people kind of got drunk with money. Uh, they were, the jobs were plentiful, uh, were plentiful, let me enunciate. Um, they were also uh, well-paying jobs. Uh, we were coming off a, a number of uh, our mothers and fathers and grandparents, they were, they had pensions. Um, they had money to travel, they had, you know, the, they had homes. Um, and what happened is, then also during that period, you know, I think I, I grew up, I'm a, I'm a child, you know, of the 80s and 90s, uh, or 80s really. Um, I had, my grandparents were at home. But what happens is you start seeing grandparents who were traveling and gone and they moved away from Florida and that wisdom started dropping off. Um, because th they had the money to do a lot more. Um, so if I, had to, if I had to nail down a dark period, personally, I would say it was somewhere, it was that 80s and 90s time frame, in my, in my personal opinion. We have one last question from the elder, right?
And that's why we have the wisdom of the elders. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Truly an, an interactive experience. Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Hicks, please, yes. Cool. So for those who didn't hear it in the live stream, um, Mr. Chuck Hicks, he is calling all people in the community to submit their um, events for Black History Month. He's printing a calendar. Uh, an, it's, a, it's an annual calendar. Um, it's due to the Washington Informer or to Mr. Chuck Hicks at Mr. Black History at Yahoo.com by the end of January. And the calendar will be out by the end of January, early February at DC Public Libraries. And I just wanted to add, I think I heard uh, him also say this is a way that you can empower yourself. It's not just if you have an event, it's that if you know of an event in the community, you can be the resource for other people. And you can share that by giving it to him um, and, and go from there. Perfect. Uh, let's give, um, yes, please. And then you in the back, sir. It's the last one. Yep. Second. We're going to get your mic. Good evening, I should say. My name is Lois Cooper, and I am the founder and director of the District of Columbia African American Legacy Foundation, DCAF for short. And before I came here today, I was at another uh, press conference for the DC Humanities Council. And there's a lot of money that has been funded to the council to tell the history about DC. And I was there, my sole reason for being there was to know what was going on. And so there's a lot of grant money available to um, tell the story of Washington, DC. And I was there fighting to have a seat in these forums so that we can be part of the narrative to tell the story because if you don't have someone who lived the story there's a chance that the story will not be authentic so what would you suggest are some of the ways that we as a group of people can be part of all the narratives the narratives are happening everywhere it's happening in our churches it's happening on the streets when you talk to people and the room that i was in was not a room of people that looked like us so you know it was an aggressive move but i have been doing um pushing the envelope to at least as an individual as you say to uh, be part of the narrative that says who we are as a people. It's a powerful question. Who wants to? Uh, sure, you. Uh, sure. One second. Let's let's give him the mic. Going to give you the mic. Civil rights era, we had the United Planning Organizations. We had our churches. We had our Thurgood Marshall Centers. 
We hate our OICs. We hate our prides. We hate our politicians, Congressman Funroy, Marion Barrows, et cetera. Those are the eras you need to go to to get the true story. In reference to what you said, my brother, I went to Martin Luther King Library three weeks ago to write a history of the Shaw community from 1970 until today. I was told that one of their staff people had written a story of U Street. But I wanted to know who did they talk to on U Street. So to that extent, to answer your question, you need to go back to those organizations that were formed right after the Civil Rights era. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sorry. What's, what's your name, sir? Harold Valentine. Let's give Mr. Valentine another hand. <laughs> um, I know you had a comment. I wanted to give the mic to my brother here. Uh, I think with, I want to get a young person to ask a question too. Okay, so once you're done talking, the young person will close off the program with the last question. So if you could just give your name, sir, and just your question. Yeah, my, na my name is Joseph Moore. I uh, live in Maryland, and uh, I founded uh, uh, PG County Parents uh, because of problems which uh, the community was facing. And uh, I didn't want it to be the person out there, but I realized there was a major need uh, for change, and especially uh, fighting for minorities. Um, I, was, I was a teacher for about 10 years, and uh, the problem is in Baltimore City. I spoke about it long before it started. I saw the pipeline, the kids were suspended, you know, they were being suspended, but um, there was, there's nothing was being done to, to help these kids. So when I spoke about it, they removed me from my job. And uh, I've been fighting for the last uh, six years. But one thing I noticed on that, uh, the questions are really directed at uh, uh, Reverend uh, Chavis. Uh, the last time I met you was about uh, you know, 10 years ago when you were driving. And I, I know your story very well. And my thing is, uh, all this time I've been fighting, I noticed the last. Uh, um, one year, every time I file a document in the court, they change the dates. This is happening. They change the dates so that the, my documents appear late. I won the case in uh, Maryland uh, Office of Administrative Appeal. Not, I, I don't want to prolong this, but I won the case. They were told to pay me um, all my back pay. Uh, it was clearly wrong for termination and discrimination for who I am the questions I was asking. They didn't want to hear this. And uh, I filed a case in federal court, but every time I get a lawyer, they pay the lawyer off. Not one, up to six lawyers got paid. Can, okay, can, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I'm, the podcaster moderator in me is going to ask you, um, what is your question for my, the panel? My, my question is this. Uh, this is happening to a lot of people over there. How do you deal with this? We have reported to, to, um, to everyone else who, who should be addressing these issues, but nothing seems to be done. How do you address issues? These are issues happening right now. Yes, how do you address it? I, yeah, how do you address it? Uh, we're not being violent. We have tried the best we can. How do you address issues? Because I know one of you will be in the same problem if we don't address this now. It, it, today is me, but t tomorrow it's be you and you know, someone else and all that. But I have a lot of evidence to show, Lily, this is not right, what's going on. So your, your question is but how do we address the, the in, injustice in the system yeah, because in terms of the disparity of you not being able to move your case forward? Absolutely, and also not, not just me. I have uh, three other people who are facing the same thing, and these are minorities. Okay, I think I can yeah. answer. I, yeah. I think I understand the question. Um, and, and I may sound like a broken record for those in live streaming and here in the, in the audience. You know, um, we keep looking at all the things in terms of a system that we don't have in place. And we say, well, today, we don't have that in place. But everything has to start somewhere. And the, the answer is, 
this is not going to materialize tomorrow because we haven't put in the work to make it materialize in that sense. And that's not saying that people have not dedicated their entire lives to the cause of social and political justice in the black community, but it, is, it's not, it has not worked because on a massive scale, we haven't taken the individual responsibility. And part of the problem is that people tend to not care until it happens to them. So the answer to the, to the question and, and to virtually any question you can ask, you're gonna hear me say the same thing. The answer is stand up today. Take individual action, starting with where you spend your money, starting with how you engage in community, starting with taking things offline and beginning to network and build, starting to identify black-owned businesses that are committed to strengthening the black community and starting to engage in the political process because maybe it's not something that'll happen for you right now with your case but maybe it's I can make sure that my niece doesn't go through that or I can make sure that these college students who are protesting when they get out of college don't have to do that. But specifically, I would say to a case about wrongful termination, we keep asking other people to employ us. Until we begin to build black owned businesses and institutions, we're gonna keep having the same problem. So my answer is let's start supporting black owned businesses that aren't gonna have discrimination issues against the black people that they are hiring. I think he's referring to the education system, are you? So, so it's, it's one thing when you try. We, we have black right, and, and my question to you, back to you, is how can you not organize within that community and, no, and mobilize them to let them know what's happening? So they're aware so you guys can go as a group versus an individual. I have about, I have about uh, 100,000 people follow my, my blog. Every day, thousands of people follow. But I'm, I'm not, I, I never grew up in the US. And uh, I don't want to say something about the court system. That's the only thing. That's the, the last result for me. And uh, I have, Head lawyers, I spent about $300,000 of my money, gone. But hope is not lost. I have a case in Supreme Court. I have a case in Fort Sucker. They, these lawyers, they started cases all over the place to wear me down. And anyway, I, I, it's important. I, I, I don't have to serve a silence. It's good to talk about this because they're going to do the same thing in the future. But... Uh, If it's education, it's where are the black institutions that will prevent the pro So we need to think ahead to, I might not be able to solve this today right now. We can still do mobilizing and organizing, but we gotta be more forward thinking. Okay. Hey y'all. Um, so during the panel, oh, my name is Erica and Oh. Um, during the panel, we talked a lot about, you know, dreaming and then waking up from the dream and doing the dream. And as a teenager, I know that it's hard because you, you, you think you find an issue and you think of like this great idea, but it just seems so unreal because it seems so much like right. And we ask adults, you know, like, how, how do we do this? And they say, well, you can do whatever you want to do and it'll, it'll work out. And that's not the answer that we're looking for. So that's why, you know, they don't really ask y'all anymore. So my question is like, how do we as teens or youth help other youth put, I guess, two and two together to make something new, to put, make the idea real? Let me. I think one, when we leave here, the responsibility is on you to own this moment. There's a reason that it was you that showed up. It was a reason that you came. So you have to own the responsibility that is now on you. That's the fine print that I didn't tell you before we came. But now when you walk out of that door, you now have a responsibility. You are obligated 
the people in this room are going to hold you accountable. I'm inviting them to come to the FBR Boys and Girls Club to check up on you to see if you did what you said you were going to go and do. Because, and not just them, but our ancestors, all the people who have gone before you and me are now waiting for you to see what you do with this moment. So you have to own this and say, this is important enough for me to go and start with one. To change the world, don't feel like you got to have a cape and go get everybody in your school. Everybody, start with one. If you can change and connect with one peer, then that peer connects with another peer and another peer and another peer. I know it's a big, big world and a big, pe a big puzzle, but you start with that one. But it starts with you all owning it. It's not enough for us to own it and to be supportive of you and to push you and to encourage you like Dr. Chavis said, even sometimes really nudge you, it's up to you to own it. Because at the moment that you own it, it becomes a fire in you that nobody or nothing can put up. That's, thank you. Okay, well we have, My all right, this is our, well, it's, it's a young person, so we're gonna. Okay, this is our last, last question. Well, yeah, last, last question. Okay. Okay, so my name is Jasmine, and I apologize to all of you guys, but I just want Mr. LaVar to, in detail, explain to the audience what he does in the FBR, in the FBR building, because he does a lot more than just working with the teens. He's like all around the building. So I just wanted to do that, so. I, I'll say it. I'll say it this way. And again, I shared earlier. This is National Mentoring Month, and I, I can't. It would be criminal of me to walk away from a room full of adults without overemphasizing to you the need for adults to walk with our young people as they discover, as they learn, as they fall, as they get back up. It does not require you to give your entire life. If you decide I'm gonna mentor with 10%, I need you to give 100% of that 10%. I hope that makes sense to you. I'm crazy and God has called me to this work. I'll be 90 years old, still running behind teenagers, trying to help them discover who they are. But we need everybody. Every single adult who knows that the people before us bled and died for us to know who we are, to come into who we are, I need every single adult to find a boys and girls club, a school, a rec center, a church, a scout league, a football team. If you are not mentoring, imparting knowledge, sharing with the next generation, you yourself are practicing criminal behavior. Dang, that is such a wonderful note to end on. Um, my pop. Uh -oh. ah, <laughs> I, I love you. So I, I, I got. All right, this, this the last one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, you just gotten me motivated. It took me a little while to. <laughs> It took me a little while to get motivated, but um, you know, all this excitement, it, it, I hope I don't start crying because I'm a, I'm a crier. But back in the 80s, I came here and this building was closed down. Um, and in 2000, it opened up and it was like, it took a lot of effort, a lot of coming together. And I'm thinking, gosh, I was a part of that. But that's not the important thing, but we had young people who were out there in, on, in the front of the building Mr. Ballantyne and, and other people who've gone on. We stand on the shoulders of those who've gone on, who, who decided, and Tommy Yearwood is because of Tommy Yearwood and the board that you know, was a Shaw Trust and then it came to be the Thurgood Marshall Center Trust. No matter the name, what matters is the passion for our young people. I'm going on 73 years old, sir, and I'm telling you, I'm chasing them from two and a half to 97 and a half. My dad will be 97 in March and he's keeping me going, actually. He's, I have to really slow down because of him. But the fact is, you're right. We have to stay at it, Mr. FDR. It sounds like, what is it? Um, yes, F FBR. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're right. We have to do it no matter what because we are losing young people out of lack of love. It's like, you know, um, 
unconditional love. Yeah, that's a biblical term. It's unconditional love. You got to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. You get a call at 7.30 in the morning. You know that you got to respond to the young people. And we got to, they should be more young people in here tonight. You know, thank you all for being here, for coming here. And thank you for asking him to, to, to give, to uh, get, tell more about what, what he does, you know? And so, um, my name is Priscilla Francis, I serve on the board, and here we have my sister Thelma here, who's here probably having um, suffered a situation. But nonetheless, I came in later than planned, but it's better late than never. And so this gentleman here, I happen to love Shaw, love DC, worked in UPO for some 30 some plus years, and still donating, committing time and energy and effort. We've got an event on the uh, 16th at the Hyatt for scholarships for young underprivileged uh, African American young children who are graduating from high school, have been accepted in a, un in a college or higher education, and this is uh, our 32nd year, you know, 32nd year that we've done that. But meanwhile, here's the mic, and on behalf of, <laughs> and on behalf of Tommy Yearwood, I want to say thank you all for coming. I won't be speaking again uh, tonight, but I just got the energy, and it, it, it is important. It's exciting. We need to have a little party after this to just fellowship. Thank you so much, and Happy New Year to all. And we want to <laughs> want to keep Tommy in our prayers as well. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. She said she's trying to party after, so if y'all know where it's at. All right, so in closing, in closing, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists to mention their organization and give contact information, and then we'll close out for real this time. I want to say to all of y'all, thank you for coming out, and keep in mind the words, all right? So whatever you do is all about action. What are you going to do when you step outside? Are you going to talk to your friends about this tomorrow? Are you going to write? Are you going to protest in the streets? Are you going to shop black? Whatever you do, just make sure you do it with love. So I'm going to give it to Big Baba. Uh, Rob, just close this out with your organization and how to get in contact and so forth. Uh, absolutely. Thank you all so much for coming out. It's important work that we do here and we keep it moving. I keep the movement moving movement moving. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Big Baba Rob, uh, www.theblackgeeks.com, enunciate theblackgeeks.com. Uh, for the Geeking Over 40 podcast, that is on SoundCloud. You just go to SoundCloud and Geeking, Geeking, no G, Geeking Over 40. Um, if you want to check out the podcast, everything is there. Um, and also Big Baba Rob on Gmail. Big Bob, you like you said, I say it too fast. Big Baba Rob, B-A-B-A-R-O-B, on Gmail. Um, feel free, Twitter, email, Tumblr, all over the place. Thank you. All right, uh, again, my name is Nataki, and I am uh, the spokesperson and one of many grassroots organizers for Let's Buy Black 365. Uh, you can get in touch with us. Uh, there's a social network component, so you can I'll create a profile and uh, you can uh, send me a friend request. Uh, again, my name is Nataki. You can go to www.let's, L-E-T-S, as in let's do it together, let's buy black 365com uh, If you're interested in doing something in your community with a group you're already participating with, uh, or just being a part of, of a movement that is bigger than yourself, uh, you can email us at getinvolved at letsbuyblack365.com. Send us your name, send us what you're good at or what you want to do, and someone will follow up with you. Uh, you can also uh, uh, follow us on Twitter uh, at Let's Buy Black 365 and uh, on, on Facebook as well. Uh, if you'd like to give someone a call, uh, you can call 301-24-9072. Uh, uh, and the only caveat to that is, if you're calling, it's not to talk about problems, it's talking about how you are to be a part of the solution. Uh, again, I'm sorry, they asked for the number again. Uh, it's 301 two four four nine zero seven two and that email address was get involved 
at Let's Buy Black 365, as in 365 days a year, dot com. Again, uh, we represent the FBR branch, Boys and Girls Club of Greater Washington. Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Washington has been in the DMV area for 125 years. We have 14 sites in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Our location is located at the Ark, uh, which if you have not been, is one of the crown jewels of Southeast on uh, Mississippi Avenue. Uh, and if you want to, we welcome you to like us on Facebook at FBR Nation. Uh, Boys and Girls Club. You can also follow us on Twitter at F-B-R-E-X Teens, T-E-E-N-S for Extreme Teens. My personal Twitter is Mr. M-I-S-T-A LeVar L-E-V-A-R So F, uh, this question was asked earlier. F-B-R is the um, investment firm that got the naming rights to our building when, they, when we first opened. Uh, they are no longer associated with us, but the name has stuck. That is our MLK, and that is our MLK panel for tonight. I wanna, again, thank everyone for coming out. Let's give our panelists another hand. My name, my name is Sam P.K. Collins. I'm a grassroots journalist, and uh, just once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>